Good afternoon to everybody. We're going now to open this new session entitled From Bench to Bedside in Arrhythmias. My name is Begoña Benito from Hospital Universitario Valdebron, and I'm co-chairing this session with Dr. Andreu Porta from Hospital Universitario Quiron in Madrid. We are very both very honored to be participating in this uh, session when, where we will have an outstanding panel of uh, speakers talking about a very interesting topics. And, the, and I just wanted to remind that uh, to the audience that all we, three conferences will take place first and then discussion will follow after the third one. Questions can be sent through the chat enabled on the broadcast page. And with no further delay, we will uh, proceed to the presentations. Andreu. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, let's get started with uh, uh, Dr. Andrea Mazzanti's presentation. Andrea Mazzanti is a clinician scientist bo working both at, uh, in Pavia as a clinician and as a scientist here, postdoctoral scientist in uh, CENIC in Madrid. He's a well-known specialist in inherited arrhythmia, and uh, we have the pleasure to have him here talking to us today. Welcome, Andrea. So hello, everybody, and thank you very much, uh, Begonia and Andreu, for the introduction. I've been requested to discuss some points about the precision medicine approach to inherited arrhythmias. So we will uh, review together just some aspects that may stimulate the discussion. So. We all know that uh, ECG parameters are inheritable in a way, and uh, this is something that we all we have always known. And some recent genome-wide association studies have demonstrated that uh, many uh, of the uh, ECG traits that we know are actually inherited across the families. So this is like in support of the idea that we may really approach ECG and the troubles of the ECG in a, in a, a preci precision medicine approach. And we know that not only the ECG is inherited, but also the arrhythmias may be inherited, as in the case we are discussing. And so I'm showing you, for instance, the case of the first family with the bidirectional uh, ventricular arrhythmias that uh, was uh, useful to Professor Priori to identify 20 years ago, the first mutations in the ryanodine receptor as the cause for dominant uh, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So in, in, a, in a wider sense, we can talk about uh, inheritance of arrhythmias and apply the concept to a broader range of pathologies that we see represented in this slide that we all know and that they, that they are collectively named as inherited arrhythmogenic conditions. So as you know, they include uh, both cardiomyopathies and channelopathies. And as you know, these are very wide range of pathologies, very heterogeneous in the clinical presentation very different in the prevalence in the populations from diseases that are very rare, like uh, as you can see on the left part of your screen, the left ventricular non-compaction or restrictive cardiomyopathy or the short QT syndrome in the field of uh, inheritance, inherited arrhythmias, but also some other that are much more fr frequent and prevalent in the general population. So although being very different in uh, all aspects that characterize this disorder, as you know, they have a common, a common trait or several common traits, uh, starting from the fact that they are familiar disorders and also to uh, predispose individuals to the development of ventricular fibrillation and more often than the general population. So in this sense, uh, to apply a precision medicine approach to this disorder may be very useful and we will review together some examples. As of course, as you know, that long QT syndrome is the archetype that we use to demonstrate the applicability of these concepts of precision medicine also to other inherited arrhythmogenic conditions. And so, as you know, in long QT syndrome, the genotype influences several aspects of the disorder, starting from the electrocardiographic manifestation. As you know, different genotypes have been associated characteristically with different appearance of the electrocardiogram of patients. But of course, this is possibly uh, related to the fact that although long QT syndrome uh, in, in a wider sense is uh, caused by mutations in up to 16 different genes or 15 like in this, in this cartoon, but as you know, we have three genes 
that uh, collectively justify more than 90% of all the cases of genotype positive patients with long QT syndrome. And this allowed to depict uh, over the year strong uh, um, correlation between the genotype and the phenotype that allowed us to understand much aspects, many aspects of the disease and therefore also to learn more about uh, the different subtypes of the disorder. So on a completely different uh, uh, page, we are uh, talking about dilated cardiomyopathy. So dilated cardiomyopathy, as you know, may be characterized in some, in some case by uh, genotype to phenotype correlations that allow us to recognize patients uh, and the genotype just based on some, for instance, in this case, electrocardiographic manifestation, as in the case of the lamine mutations where we have a conduction disorders associated with dilated cardiomyopathy, or where in the case of the phospholamban mutations, that, as you know, are very much prevalent uh, in, in the Netherlands, where Professor Vilte comes from, because they, have, uh, they are associated with a severe um, phenotype and the presence of small QRS complexes on the electrocardiogram, or in the case of desmoplakin mutations, where, you know, we have characteristically negative T waves on the lateral electrocardiographic leads. But in general, it's much more difficult when we discuss about the dilated cardiomyopathy to get uh, uh, important correlations between the genotype and the phenotype for a simple reason, because in the dilated cardiomyopathy field, we know that all and many different proteins that make up a cardiomyocytes or the junction between the two different cardiomyocytes, when mutated, may give origin to a phenotype of dilated cardiomyopathy. So as you understand, it's much more difficult to obtain large populations of patients with the homogeneous genetic background. Maybe phospholamban mutations are one exception in this case. But the reality nowadays, as you know, is that the yield of genetic study in dilated cardiomyopathy for individual gene is much lower of what we know for, the, for instance, long QT syndrome. And you see that most of the genes have been associated to less than 5% of the cases individually. And also collectively, the, geno the yield of genetic screening is not as high as in the long QT syndrome. Of course, you know we have one exception, and the exception is titin, that alone, according to the, um, some, uh, let's say, uh, case uh, series, justify up to 20% of the cases of dilated cardiomyopathy. And in fact, in this case, maybe we can get some uh, genotype to phenotype correlation that may be useful to uh, manage patients. So uh, talking about management, we arrived to, the, to talking about risk stratification. And again, we start from the long QT syndrome. You know very well, I don't need to stop on this, but you know very well that it's a long time known since the last 20 years that the genotype together with the duration of QT interval influences the prognosis of patients with long QT syndrome. And likewise, as I was telling you, also in the field of dilated cardiomyopathy, we know that some mutations have been associated to a more severe prognosis. So again, we can be precise in managing our patients and also in assessing the risk that they have to suffer adverse events just because we know the genotype. So also in this case, we have an example. But in the field of cardiomyopathies, we know something more. For instance, this work that was dated by like almost 35, 30 years ago by the uh, Watkins, was like already associating different mutations that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to different uh, cores of the disease. So we know that uh, when we gather enough information, we may obtain important information for the, the risk assessment of patients based on genotype. And I have to tell you, you are very lucky in Spain because you have some group, like for instance in La Coruña or for instance in Murcia, where there are people who have a, a world expert recognized in the assessment of the genetic substrate of patients and the correlation between a certain genotype and the uh, clinical course of the patients. So I think in, in this sense, Spain is much more advanced than other countries. So you are very lucky. Another important aspect that we may want to discuss is the response to therapy. Again, you know that not all genotype of long QT syndrome responds in the same way uh, to the treatment with beta blockers. And you know that long QT syndrome type 1 are those who respond better to treatment. And of course, also in the field of related cardiomyopathy, we may have some differential response to treatment. And for instance, we know that as compared to limonene patients, those with the titan mutations have a better prognosis. And also, 
a better response to treatment when they start uh, anti uh, anti um, failure treatment. So, for instance, beta blockers or uh, ACE inhibitors, and they have a better uh, uh, reverse remodeling than patients with lemming mutation. So, and let me finish with just something that you already know, probably about the possibility to choose the treatment for your patient based on the genotype. Of course, in the field of long QT syndrome, you know very well that we may use for the long QT syndrome type 3, we can use sodium channel blockers to reduce the late component of the inward sodium current and therefore correct the phenotype of our patient. And here you see, for instance, the example in the animal model that was used with the drug-induced <clears throat> long QT syndrome type 3 by administration of antopleurin. Uh, in that case, the uh, administration together with the antopleurin of mexidatin was able to reduce the duration of the action potential in this guinea pig model or long QT syndrome. And this was uh, seminal to the discovery that we may also treat patients, as you see in a couple of examples here, after mexilatin, we may shorten the duration of the QT interval in the majority of patients with long QT syndrome type 3. And you see in this graphic, we are also able to obtain completely normal duration of the QT interval for most of the patients. Of course, not all mutations respond in the same way. I don't have time to enter in this now, but it's important. It's not only long QT syndrome type 3, they have the same homogeneous response to treatment, but some patients with some mutation will not answer as the other. So we have like the duty to know very well which is the, the genotype of our patients also when we administer anxiety that also is able to reduce the arrhythmic events, not only the duration of the QT intervals. This was the demonstration that we got that by changing the substrate of our patients, also in the field of inherited arrhythmias, we are able to change the course of the disorder, which is important because it is like an example that we may pursue for also for other forms of inherited arrhythmias. So, and just closing with the gene therapy, which is of course like the, 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 golden, uh, the golden fruit that we want to find for patients with inherited arrhythmias, the possibility to correct the genetic defect underlying the disorder in each of our patients. And again, we have like from starting from uh, uh, channelopathies and in the case of uh, uh, CPVT, we have like the strongest evidence in support of the fact that we may be able to correct the genetic defect underlying the disorder and therefore also reducing and changing the arrhythmogenic substrate. Of course, I mean, the field of inherited arrhythmias is easier to approach in this sense because cardiomyopathies are much more complex. To, to, to transform once they appeared. But in the case of a CPVT, we were able to demonstrate that we are able to, to correct both the recessive variant of CPVT due to the loss of calcequestin by inducing the cells of the cardiomyocytes to uh, express the, 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 the synthesis of a, of a functioning calcequestin protein in, in the mice. And this was able to, to abolish the uh, the bidirectional arrhythmias that we usually see in the mice with the CPVT in the recessive form. And also for the, for the um, dominant variant of the disorder, we were able to silence the uh, mutant allele by using um, uh, like small interference RNA. And this was able again to obtain an almost complete suppression of the delay after the polarization at the cellular level and also of the uh, arrhythmias on the surface ECG. And this was possible to obtain because we were able to reduce the expression selectively of the mutant allele, which is something very important as a demonstration that it is possible to be selective in uh, the silencing. Of, co of course, we don't want to silence also the functioning, for functioning allele. So we, we, this was important as a proof of concept that we, we may be selective. So just in conclusion, I think that it is really possible and it is really something that we have to do to personalize the approach to our patients with inherited arrhythmias channelopathies and cardiomyopathies, knowing the, the genetic background on the individual patient that helps us to diagnose the patient, to re-stratify and also to choose the best treatment. And I thank you very much for your attention and I hope that I was on time. Thank you, Andrea. This was uh, fascinating. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure uh, to have you here at Tanik being my colleague as well. So it, this is great. It is my uh, 
honor now to introduce uh, Dr. David Filgueiras. Uh, he's also a clinician scientist focused in uh, his research in atrial fibrillation. He works at Hospital Clinico San Carlos here in Madrid and has a translational arrhythmia lab in uh, Zenic. And he's got a wonderful atrial fibrillation uh, swine model that has given us uh, very uh, nice results and it will be a uh, great talk. Welcome, David. The floor is yours. Thank you, Andreo, for the introduction. And um, I would like to start with uh, 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 saying thank you to the scientific co committee for this uh, invitation. So I'm going to talk about the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation and translation to the AP lab. So this is uh, my slide with my conflict of interest related to this talk. And as you all know that uh, the triggers of atrial fibrillation commonly come from the pulmonary veins. And in fact, the isolation of the pulmonary veins is an effective treatment in many patients, especially in paroxysmal AF. These triggers may be also present in persistent atrial fibrillation. And uh, commonly these triggers may come from other areas outside the pulmonary veins. And if we target those, those may that treatment may be effective to prevent further recurrences. The problem is not the triggers. The problem is when we identify the mechanisms, so we want to identify the mechanisms that sustain atrial fibrillation. And those mechanisms are quite complex. Uh, we can have uh, patterns that we try to identify then some, they may look, some of them may look like reentrant activity, others like uh, focal activity, others like waves wandering or uh, drifting through the atria. And this is quite complex, especially to identify those with conventional electrograms. So as the AF becomes persistent, these mechanisms uh, become further complex uh, and the complexity is difficult to, to identify with conventional tools. So we took advantage of our peak model to try to understand what the specific mechanisms in terms of atrial fibrillation dynamics may sustain atrial fibrillation. We developed this peak model where we implant a pacemaker and we put two leads, in, one of them in the atria, in the right atrium, and the other one in the uh, ventricle. We perform then AV node ablation, and then we start the protocol uh, pacing the atria at very fast, uh, a very fast rate, about 20 hertz. We do the AV node ablation because otherwise we will develop a heart failure model with tachycardiomyopathy, so we want to avoid that. And as you see here, once we start to stimulate, we start to see short-lasting episodes, and after a period that may last for several weeks or even months, we will see uh, sustained episodes that will become self-sustained and without termination uh, after several months and what we call uh, persistent AF if they match with the clinical criteria of more than seven days. So in this model, we see that uh, uh, there is a significant development of atrial fibrosis, uh, especially in the posterior left atrium. And this is much larger, the fibrosis, than in the controls, the shan operated animals. We can see in these slides of histology how the fibrosis becomes uh, evident in, in the atrial fibrillation model. Uh, if we look at the fibrosis, this is a very important information, piece of information. Uh, when we perform atrial biopsies during, development, during the development of atrial fibrillation, we see how the fibrosis increases from baseline uh, after the first check with 100% AF burden. So fibrosis is an early marker in the tissue. When we see fibrosis early and remains high, after long-term persistent atrial fibrillation. If we look at inflammatory biomarkers in the biopsies, in the atrial biopsies, we see that they only increase at the very late stages in long-term persistent atrial fibrillation. They, this may become confusing because in patients, we have seen the studies where interleukins are already elevated in patients with paroxysmal AF. And this is not the case in animals. But if we look at it fully at patients, look at this, when we recruit patients with AF history with less than six months, with episodes, sorry, lasting less than six months with paroxysmal or persistent AF, and we look at the inflammatory biomarkers, we don't see an elevation on those biomarkers. 
And this is the case because those patients were recruited with, with, with a very low um, proportion of comorbidities. So if we look at those patients, we see that the inflammatory biomarkers are not different between paroxysmal and persistent AF, as long as persistent AF has been lasting less than, less than six months. But if we look at a fibrotic biomarker, that's galactin-3, we'll see significant difference already in persistent, between paroxysmal and persistent AF, even though the comorbidities were very low. So we can say that fibrosis is an important, an important factor in the development of persistent atrial fibrillation either in uh, both in the animal model, but also in patients. So other factors that uh, affect remodeling are electrical remodeling. The action potential becomes shorter and shorter from paroxysmal to the tra transition to persistent atrial fibrillation, and that leads to an acceleration of the reentrant activity. It may, it may become even uh, double the, the frequency of the atrial rotational activity. So if we look at this single or simple scenario with paroxysmal AF, we see rotational activity quite simple in this simulation. But if we go to a more complex scenario with fibrosis, we see that rotational activity may be in many different areas. Even this is a 2D simulation, imagine in a 3D uh, layer like, uh, or in a CD, uh, 3D tissue like the atria, it will be much more complex. This is the reality when we look at the atrial waves with optical mapping in animals with persistent atrial fibrillation, we see that rotational activity is in different areas where the white spots are, and they are moving and they are here and in the top of the image. And uh, sometimes this is difficult to track, right? If we look at other movies, also in persistent EF with uh, optical mapping, we see that in this case, the rotational activity looks much simpler, but it's drifting and moving away from the mapping we do after a few seconds. So this is a complex scenario, even though sometimes it's uh, easier to understand than others. So how to find a way to map this in the clinical lab? Because this is difficult. This is drifting. This is not stable most of times. I've seen just once and a stable uh, rotor or reentrant activity for several minutes. That's very difficult to see. So we wanted to find a way to identify that rotational activity that is drifting, that's the reality. And we became, became with this idea of using instantaneous frequency and amplitude modulation. We realized that the, when the rotational activity was crossing a specific spots like this one, uh, where the rotational activity will cross uh, through this area, we will see a modulation in frequency, as you see here, and a modulation in amplitude. You see how the action potential signal is becoming almost zero. And then when the rotational activity goes away, the amplitude and frequency increase. So, the, sorry, the amplitude increases and the frequency decreases. If the rotational activity crosses again through the same spot, we will see the same phenomenon again with decrease in amplitude and an increase in frequency. This is what we call modulation in frequency and amplitude. Of course, we have the solution because we have optical mapping and we can see whether rotational activity is there or not. <coughs> For example, here is the solution. We have the optical mapping movie. We see a drifting rotor coming inside the mapping window and this drifting rotor is going away after a few seconds. So this will be the high resolution movie, the drifting activity, rotational activities in the red spot or in the red area. And if we use single signals to analyze where the rotational activity will be using instantaneous amplitude and frequency modulation, we will have this map on the bottom. So more or less is the similar pattern or a footprint pattern of the rotational activity just using single signals. Of course, this is using optical mapping that is the whole standard. But if we use in vivo data and we have complex patterns like this one in the optical mapping movie, what would happen? So in in vivo data, we will see rotational activity in many different areas of the atria. Look at this, using a criterion with two or more 
consecutive cycles, many different areas will host rotational activity. If we increase that threshold to at least five or more consecutive cycles, the areas with rotational activity will be substantially less, but still we have a wide spread area um, across the area with rotational activity. This means that rotational activity seems to be completely unspecific. So if we target all those areas, probably we will terminate AF, but we are treating too much. We are burning too much area to terminate atrial fibrillation. So in fact, if we compare the areas where we terminate AF and we look at all those areas where rotational activity was present, we can see that most of the rotational activity was outside the areas where, in fact, we terminated AF. This might look different from other series, but if we look at different series, using different series with different approaches to identify drivers of atrial fibrillation, we can see that most of uh, investigators also identify that rotational activity is the main pattern that they identify. So in the purple color, you can see that most of series identify rotational activity as the main pattern, the same like us. But this, what I was telling before is that rotational activity is not only important, it's highly specific. We need to filter that rotational activity and know what is important. In fact, when the substrate evolves and we go from paroxysmal to persistent, long-standing persistent AF, we see that it's much more complex and much more difficult to treat. In fact, different investigators from different series, what they report is that they need larger ablation time to treat more complex, uh, more complex cases with long-standing persistent AF. Of course, if they target all rotational activity, it will be too much. Uh, some investigators report more than one hour of radio frequency delivery. That is quite a lot if we, if we know that this quite a lot of time to deliver more than nana, one hour of radio frequency in, in the age, yeah. So we need to find a way to filter what is important within the rotational activity. Using uh, uh, a criteria the, that is to identify the areas with higher than surrounding instantaneous frequency modulation, we can filter and identify specific areas that have, that have higher than surrounding instantaneous frequency modulation. And in this case, this uh, small square in white will say that rotational activity is there. Rotational activity is in many other areas of the atria. You can see squares everywhere in the atria, but in this specific one, they will have the highest score with the higher than surrounding instantaneous frequency modulation. In fact, if we treat this area, AF terminates. And in, in this case, specifically, it terminated. For example, if we use dominant frequency as in the radar study, uh, all those areas will be much uh, widely spread. And probably this is one of the reasons because the radar study could not demonstrate that targeting specific areas will terminate AF. So there is a way to filter and identify specific areas with rotational activity that are important and not secondary activity. Thank you. So are those areas stable? And in fact, they are. When we do two maps within the same procedure, we can see that those areas are stable. In fact, an, another procedure performed almost that three months before the index procedure, we can see that those areas were still there. So we can say that areas that sustain AF are stable in time. And if we move to patients, we can see that in some cases, after isolation and the pulmonary veins and, and recurrences of persistent AF, we can identify a specific areas that when we treat those areas, AF terminates. And if we try to reinduce, we can induce flutter, as in this case, but flutter can be uh, ablated, uh, as in this case, the cabotrichospet isthmus. In other cases, this is very similar to animals. When the substrate is very much remodeled, we will find areas that we cannot target with catheter ablation, as in this case, both appendages are the leading regions driving AF. We cannot treat that. We should find another solution for those patients. 
In fact, when we analyze our preliminary data from using this approach, we can see that patients that have recurrences after a mechanistic approach have larger areas in the atria that are driven uh, the, the, the AF maintenance. And those with the smaller areas are the ones that do not have recurrences. So we propose uh, to develop a more complex animal model with long-standing persistent AF at this one. And you see how the substrate have uh, shown, in this case, very large areas in both appendages plus the, plus the posterior wall, what we need to ablate. We cannot ablate that with a catheter ablation. So we combine it, a catheter ablation approach with a mini minimal thoracoscopy ablation approach. And if you see the results here, after catheter ablation, we cannot terminate atrial fibrillation. Then we target the left atrial appendage with cryoablation and affected the atrial fibrillation dynamics. Then we went to the right atrial appendage, which are also dominant, and we terminated the AF to atrial flutter that could be terminated after ablation of the atrialismus, uh, mitralismus. So this means that in very complex substrates, we will need to approach that case with a combination of catheter ablation plus probably a surgical approach. So we propose the following. In cases with persistent AF and recurrences despite pulmonary vein uh, isolation, we can have this scenario that will be very feasible to target with catheter ablation or this complex scenario that we cannot target with catheter ablation, we should talk to another institution or our institution and, and provide a different solution. So the key question will be to identify patients before they become too complex. Using electrical remodeling, we can see that some patients develop uh, uh, persistent AF, but also electrical remodeling very slowly until they reach a steady state on the roof, on the top, versus other patients that develop very fast remodeling and they reach the top very soon. So we will have much more room to treat these patients than these cases with very fast remodeling. In fact, looking at 200 patients where we were uh, uh, monitoring the, the, the remodeling from the beginning of paroxysmal AS to the end of persistent AF, and we can see that the average time to complete remodeling is three months. So we, we keep a patient in persistent AF for more than three months, probably most of them will be already very much remodeled. And finally, I conclude with these sentences that I think the translational research using clinical relevant animal models provide highly valuable data for understanding complex cardiac arrhythmia as atrial fibrillation. It's also important to say that novel and clinical compatible diagnostic and treatment tools can be developed based on robust understanding of fibrillation dynamics. And finally, validation of patient-specific AF mapping and ablation strategies grants further investigation in the clinic. And finally, let me thank to all the collaborators and the lab members for the strong and important uh, work every day and also the funding agencies. Of course, without them, it's not possible to develop this, uh, this kind of science. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for a very interesting talk. Um, and now I will introduce uh, our next speaker, will be uh, Dr. Arthur Wilde. He needs a little presentation, a little introduction, introduction because he's very well known um, for his uh, expertise, expertise in all the aspects concerning um, arrhythmia, inherited arrhythmia syndromes. And today he's going to talk about risk stratification and channel apathies. I'm sure he will have very interesting things to share with us. So whenever you want, uh, Dr. Wille, welcome. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. I'm sorry I have to speak at the moment. Your country is playing in the Euro soccer games, but it's the break uh, right now and you are leading with one to zero, as I understand. So my topic addressed is risk stratification in channel opities. And my affiliation is the Amsterdam UMC in Amsterdam. And I'm also a member of the European Reference Network for Rare Cardiac Diseases. And the familial arrhythmia syndromes are generally subdivided in where the arrhythmogenic substrate is. It can be found in the electrical characteristics of the heart or in the structural characteristics of the heart. And the topic of today 
is uh, this part. And this part can be subdivided into uh, several uh, individual syndromes, like the long QT syndrome, the short QT syndrome, the Bugatti syndrome, catecholamine-induced polymorphic VT, and a number of others that are more rare. And when you ask me to speak about risk stratification in all these uh, arrhythmia syndromes, it's obviously impossible to do that in, in the 12 to 50 minutes. I even decided to skip Bugara syndrome because that is a topic uh, in itself with a lot of controversy. Uh, so I decided to focus uh, for this talk on um, long QT syndrome and catecholamine induced VT. Uh, the number of genes that are associated with it have been um, much larger than the list that is uh, up this slide now. But this is after um, a very structural uh, gene, a ClinGen a gene creation effort where the number of long QT genes was brought down from, from the 15 or 16 to seven that, are, that have real sound evidence for association with long QT syndrome. And for the others, it is less sound. For Bugatti syndrome, as you may know, the number of genes involved was over 20 but this has been brought back to just one, and that is uh, SCN5. Catecholamine-induced polymorphic PT is uh, six. So I will focus in this talk on long QT syndrome and catecholamine-induced polymorphic PT because that will take about 10 minutes uh, together. Now, the long QT syndrome is an uh, autosomal uh, dominant uh, disease. Sometimes it's autosomal uh, recessive, with associated with deafness. Uh, it's genetically heterogeneous, and there were originally 17 genes associated, but after the ClinGen approach, there were seven left. And if you start to genotyping, you will do so successfully in 60%, uh, but in families, uh, it will be over 90%. And as uh, Dr. Mazanti has already uh, shown, it's uh, most often LQT1, 2, and 3. And there are gene-specific features for these uh, three subtypes. The risk factors in long QT syndrome um, in general are, of course, a patient that already has suffered an aborted sudden death uh, episode, so resuscitated uh, cardiac arrest. But also patients with syncopal events are at risk. Importantly, family history of an aborted sudden cardiac death is not, has never been shown to be a real risk factor. It's an emotional factor in the discussion with the patient, but it's not <coughs> a sound uh, risk factor. And then, of course, the presence or documentation of the tosar point episode or a T-wave uh, alternance episode. The QT prolongation itself and patients with congenital deafness, the Chiavon and Lange-Nielsen syndrome, that are um, imp important uh, risk factors. Uh, these two are obviously uh, EKG-based. Uh, the tosar point T-wave alternance, I will show you an example of it uh, later and the QT prolongation itself. Um, other, other, uh, the, the QT prolongation is relevant for risk when it goes over uh, 500 milliseconds in general, but that is, that is better uh, detailed uh, in later slides. The T-wave morphology is important, and particularly when there is the presence of T-wave alternance. QT dispersion is a difficult parameter, but if it's very high, it's probably prorhythmic. <clears throat> heart rate when it's low and when the conduction block and the those are the plant arrhythmias itself. And this is clearly, clearly an example of a patient that is at very high risk. This was a 20-year-old female who was deaf and had syncopal events. And the um, EKG is obviously very abnormal with weird uh, QT intervals. Unfortunately, the um, EKG apparatus also identified this EKG as an abnormal EKG. And clearly, the QT prolongation is the issue here. <clears throat> this slide is from the same study that Dr. Mazanti alluded on from the Priori's paper in the New England Journal in 2003. And it shows that the QT interval is, is a main determinant of risk. The longer the QT interval, when you are in the fourth quartile, so QT over 500, you are at higher, highest risk for uh, events in the first 40 years of life. Uh, and it's, um, it is more or less dose dependent. If the QT is a little shorter, you are here. If it's uh, normal, you are still at 10 to 20% risk, but, but that doesn't, uh, that, is, that is not equal to the 70% risk that you have when the QT is over 500. 
Now, this is the uh, yearly risk uh, rate for the different QT intervals. So when you're over 500, the yearly risk is about 2%. And this is on, on lethal uh, arrhythmias, or near lethal arrhythmias. Now, this brought the um, uh, Pavia group at that time uh, to, to give this risk uh, certification. So the highest risk is in the group with the longest QTC. And at that point in time, it was thought not to be quite very much different for LPT1, 2, and 3, although particularly males with LPT3 are in this high-risk category. If the QTC is normal for all um, except LPT3, uh, there is a very low risk and there is this intermediate risk group. So already here you can see that the QT interval interacts with gender and the LQT subtype. In a later study from Dr. Masanti, uh, published in Jack in 2018, based on over 1,700 patients, it becomes a little bit more detailed. Uh, what you see here is a five-year risk of life-threatening arrhythmias of therapy. That is important. And there is the, the risk here is 6%, higher than 6% in LQT2 patients and LQT3 patients with a slightly different QTC interval. The percentage of patients in this risk range is around 7%. The slightly lower risk between 3 and 6% is in this category, so QT1 with very long QT intervals, a little shorter QT intervals with LQT2, and even shorter with LQT3. So it becomes more important to determine the genotype and the QT interval at baseline. This is all off therapy, and in there, uh, hence, Navalol has a very important risk reduction uh, compared to other beta blockers. This is an example of a young neonate with prenatal bradycardia uh, based on functional AV blockers. I will show you in the next slide, but this slide is to show an example of uh, ST alternates, QT alternates, the negative T wave here, the positive one here, the negative here, the positive one, etc. So this is a phase that is very prorhythmic and there may be an arrhythmia in the next uh, uh, seconds or so. This is the same child when the bradycardia was there, but it, you can see it's, it's caused by a functional AV block. The QT interval is so long that the sinus P wave cannot conduct the ventricles because they are still refractory. So these are examples of a patient, in this case a neonate, that is at very high risk for cardiac events. So in summary, um, in the long QT syndrome, the risk depends on the phenotype. Gender, females at adult age, but at the very young age, it's more males. The QT interval, obviously, is key, and specific EKG features, as I've mentioned. And the genotype is also important, uh, and there are even, and I haven't discussed that, and that is also not discussed in the uh, paper from Andrea uh, that I showed you, is the typical mutations that are at higher risk, for example, poor mutations in the long QT type 1, C-loop mutations, specific mutations that are very high risk. In the long QT, it's more or less four mutations that be at the highest risk. And LQT3, it's less clear. For some, we know that there are relatively benign. And I think this uh, very gene-specific risk stratification still has to be developed more. <clears throat> when I switch to um, catecholamine-induced uh, CPVT, CPVT, this is an example of a bidirectional tachycardia, similar to what Andrea showed you before during an exercise test. And the disease is also autosomal dominant, genetic heterogeneous, with sick genes approved by the ClinGen algorithm. The complaints are mostly, or maybe even exclusively, during exercise and emotion. Uh, be aware that it can start at normal age, and certainly be aware that the baseline EKG is completely normal. Some bradycardia may be there, but overall it's, it's normal. The di diagnosis is reached uh, in the presence of a structural normal heart, uh, a normal EKG, baseline EKG, and unexplained exercise to catecholamine induced arrhythmias. Uh, and that is in a patient below the age of 40, because when the patient is over 40, you have to exclude coronary artery disease uh, as well. You can also diagnose CPVT when there is a pathogenic mutation identified in a family member. Um, and in patients with, um, with uh, clear uh, EKG abnormalities during exercise. We recently, Mike Ackerman and I recently proposed uh, 
the similar uh, risk score or, or, or score for a diagnosis like the Schwartz score for Long QT syndrome. I'm not going into too much detail, but this, of course, also includes symptoms, the, the characteristics of the exercise test, um, but also the, uh, the genetics are included here or the whole thing. And if you have an evidence for uh, cardiac structural disease, points are subtracted and you need uh, over 3.5 points for clinical diagnosis. So this is an overview of the series published between 2002 and 2009. The penetrance of the disease is not 100%. So that means that when the exercise test is, is normal, that does not exclude CPVT. Um, and also importantly, the response to beta blocker is also not 100%. Uh, between 30 to 40% of patients can actually not respond completely to beta blocker and you need additional therapy in these patients. Uh, in the, 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 further, the, the, the two slides that I just showed was on probands. This is a slide exclusively on relatives. And this is just to show that the penetrance in relatives is even lower, can be as low as 95%. So you miss quite a lot of patients with just the exercise tests. And whether these patients are really not at risk at all is not uh, well defined. This is the paper uh, when it comes to risk gratification. The factors that uh, out of this study uh, were uh, identified as risk factors is the cardiac arrest prior to therapy, as in the long QT syndrome, but also the complexity of ectopy on the exercise test and on treatment, that is important, so that, and, and the complexity when it's higher than more than two doublets, uh, your patient should be considered at risk. And whether this is the case for the baseline exercise test before therapy is not known, but it's certainly a risk factor when doublets are still there when the patient is on therapy. And of course, the presence of syncopal events. And from other papers, we know that when the onset of symptoms is at very young age, under the age of 10, <clears throat> your patient is at risk at later age. And we demonstrated when the CPVT is associated with mental retardation, then the patient is also at, at relatively high risk uh, and it, it seems to be that the CP, the, the rhinidine receptor mutations are more dysfunctional uh, when they are associated with mental retardation. And from our paper published in 2012, there is some evidence that uh, genetics play a role as well in CPVT. Uh, the presence of uh, mutations in this part of the channel uh, carry a higher risk on ventricular tachycardia. So in conclusion, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, there's the uh, inherited arrhythmia risk, uh, risk assessment in the long QT syndrome. It's mainly the QT interval itself when the QT is over 500, but the genetic interacts importantly with that. Uh, and this value may be different for LQT1 and, or LQT3. It's most relevant for LQT3 and 2 and less relevant for LQT1 but also specific EKG characteristics that bear a high risk. And in CPPT, it was the presence of a cardiac arrest prior to diagnosis. A young age at the first episode of the first symptom, mental retardation and complex ectopy on treatment. Now, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Wille, for a... Uh, Great overview of the risk of stratification of some of the channelopathies. Let's move now to questions. And while we wait for some questions to come from the audience, I would like to ask uh, to Dr. Mazanti uh, about precision medicine in CPVT. And uh, specifically, I would like to ask about gene editing. Uh, you showed some results uh, using um, uh, silencing, gene silencing, which provide a, a very good therapy for specific mutations. But I was wondering, which is the role or what are the limitations of using other technologies like CRISP-Cas9 or trying to or aim at uh, correcting the whole gene irrespective to the muta mutation itself? So not addressed to a specific mutation, but rather addressed to uh, provide a normal gene. 
Sì, ok. Uh, this is a complex question, Begonia. So, the, <laughs> so the, 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 the feasibility of CRISPR-Cas9 technology in the heart has been like a taboo for many years because you know that CRISPR-Cas9 relies on the, on the presence of some enzymes that like, uh, are active only in the phases of mitosis. So for the long time, this was not considered feasible to modify and edit the... But you know that this is not the case. There have been cases that have been published and they, uh, it has been demonstrated that you, if you apply the correction in the very early phase of embryogenesis, it is possible actually to induce using CRISPR-Cas9. And in that case, you have like two possibilities. You can either decide to use an, the so-called non-homologous repair, we just use CRISPR-Cas9 to induce a truncation on the, on the allele that is mutated, that was attempted in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the attempt is just that you eliminate the allele that is uh, mutated. And in that case, you create, a, like, let's say, an apple insufficiency. Or, and then, because in the case you have a mutation that induces the so called uh, poisoning effect, the poisoning peptide you want to eliminate. Like in the case, for instance, you could uh, think about it for a long QT syndrome or like type 2, where you have tetramers, and if you have monomers that have the mutation, they may affect the function of the other uh, functional peptides when they assemble to, to, form, to form the to form the tetramers. And this is the reason, for instance, why we were seeing that uh, uh, it may happen that patients with uh, two mutations in KCNQ1, they are deaf and uh, they have like a very severe phenotype, whereas the father of these children, they have a milder phenotype when they have just heterozygous mutation. So this could be an attempt. The other possibility is that you use, you induce like the, the correction of the DNA, providing a template for the machinery to set up and correct. So th this is uh, doable in, uh, in, in theory and also in the case uh, on, in the CPVT, I think that it was attempted and it was uh, like uh, tried just like in vitro, of course, because the problem is correcting the embryos in such an early phase. So for instance, one of the problems that we have used uh, always uh, when you deal with uh, inherited arrhythmias is the availability of animal models that allow you to test uh, the, 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 the attempts. So, but in theory, it is possible to do. So, uh, with the, with the, whereas, and this, this choice, for instance, using like to, to knock out the mutant allele in using CRISPR Cas9 just to truncation where you have the mutation, then it could allow also to use a combined gen a genetic strategy to also induce by another, using another vector to induce the synthesis or more uh, of the wild type uh, of the wild type protein. So in the case of uh, CPVT, this could be a possibility. There is like one problem because you know that uh, uh, viral vectors, they have like a certain uh, availability of a space. They, not ca they cannot carry very large uh, genomes. And so, for instance, in the case of the ryanodine receptor, the problem is that it is very huge. So, for instance, adeno-associated virus cannot carry such large uh, genomes. But in theory, that could be like a combined approach that could be feasible. Okay, thank you very much. For, following, up, following up on this uh, matter of personalizing uh, treatment, I wanted to ask you uh, and Dr. Wilde about the possibility of, of using uh, the cells from uh, the patients with a mutation and then target, um, you know, differentiate them into stem cells and then cardiomyocytes and choice of the treatment based on the response on the cardiomyocytes. Is this something that is, you see it happening in the future? Is it already happening? Well, how do you see, how do you foresee this going on? Well, if, if I may start, my, my concern with that policy is that the myocytes, uh, iPS cells in particular, are still a little bit immature. And, uh, but, but for the long QT syndrome, for example, the response to drugs is, is well studied and has been uh, proven to be quite uh, successful. So I think you can use that type of therapy to show where the patients are responsive to certain uh, therapy. The example that Andrea showed with maxillotin, that not, not every LQT3 patient is responding to maxillotin, can be studied with, with IPS cells. And I bet that one patient where the QTC becomes longer on maxillotin will have that response in the stem cells as well. 
but it's a very laborious technique and a very laborious way. And you may ask the question, why not try it in the patient, him or herself, and have them observe for two days. And if you don't see prolongation or you see re reduction of the QT interval, you're fine to send the patient home with that therapy. Mm -hmm. but, but for okay. new drugs, it's certainly a way to go. Dr. Wille, uh, I know that you purposely escaped uh, risk of stratification in Brugada syndrome. Um, I just want to ask you a question regarding, because we've been um, talking about the same risk factors in Brugada syndrome over the last 20 years and, uh, or 15 years. And I wanted to ask you if you see any other potential markers or any place for other markers for risk of stratification of Brugada syndrome. Um, besides symptoms, ECG, and the classical risk markers that we all know. Like, I was thinking about maybe about inflammation or some other markers, since we re it has recently shown that some inflammation could play a role in the, the progression of the disease. So do you see any potential for other markers, aside from the, the ones we know already? Uh, that's, that's a very difficult question that I indeed... Uh try to avoid. Uh, but the, the, I think the answer will come from the group of uh, Paolo Papone in Milano. He has done a lot of ablations. So he has in his hands uh, the substrate of these patients, the mapping substrate in the right ventricular artery tract. And he, of course, has the clinical data of these patients. And, and, it, and what it, it seems to me what matters is the size of the substrate. He has clearly shown that that the substrate is is large, there is uh, easy inducibility. If the substrate is very small, there's no inducibility or there's even not the type one EKG on the baseline EKG. But, but so he has, I think about uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 patients now with a substrate and the baseline EKG. And, and maybe with, with artificial intelligence techniques, you can couple those two things and you can come up with, with EKG markers that really predict the presence of the substrate. Uh, you can also do it with, with biomarkers. I have no no idea. Or I don't exclude it. But but you have. I don't think you should couple it to the the baseline EKG. And that is the point I want to make. All the risk certification studies that we have done so far are based on the baseline EKG or on the type one EKG at baseline. But if the patient doesn't have a type one EKG, he might have it next time. But the substrate is is probably there all the time. So if you have that large number of patients with the, with the substrate mapped, then you are able to, to do the risk stratification again with, with all the clinical markers that he has. And, and it, he will start with the EKG, but he also has taken blood samples, he has the genetics and, and so on. Thank you very much. I think the, the field will move forward, but, but the data will come from Milano. I have a question for uh, David. Now we are uh, uh, in the middle of a pandemic and uh, pr maybe the next pandemic will be atrial fibrillation with the aging of the population. Wh which one of the markers you are looking at um, may be useful to select which patients could benefit from an early intervention? Because uh, there will be a time where we will have to uh, maybe non-invasively look at which patients could benefit from a, an invasive procedure to stop the, their AF. Which markers do you think will be uh, useful in the future for us? So I think one of the most useful biomarkers uh, will be uh, no, to know data about electrical remodeling. And electrical remodeling can be obtained from surface ECG. Theoretically, that's not easy. You need good signals and some processing, but it's not been invasive. And this is a huge advantage. Also probably, sorry. We have one minute for the- Ah, uh, one minute. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so then, um, so electrical remodeling, I think is a good option. So we have done it with implantable devices, pacemakers and ICDs, and it works very well. But of course, from a surface ECG, you will need to cancel the QRS uh, T complex to obtain the atrial signals. And nowadays that that's feasible, but you need uh, good devices to obtain that data. And especially probably you will need long-term recordings to monitor all the episodes and to know how it's changing over time. 
And uh, also probably some blood biomarkers will be very helpful to know microRNAs, to know, uh, and also fibrosis biomarkers will provide a much uh, accurate profile about the stage of your atria. How advanced is the remodeling? How long can you wait until the procedure? Because we know that if you perform the procedure early before the remodeling is complete, the outcome is completely different. So we all know that already. Thank you. Well, I think there are no questions from the audience. So uh, maybe it's time um, to close this session. Thank you for all, uh, to all the speakers because these were very interesting uh, speeches, all of them speeches. So thank you, you all. And um, I hope to see you in future um, congresses at here at RITMO. Okay. Thank you Bye. very much to all. Bye, Bye now. Bye.